In this video, we're going to start talking about electron dot structures. So this is for covalent compounds. Remember, a covalent compound is when we take a unpaired electron from one nonmetal and an unpaired electron from another nonmetal. We start sharing them so that both of them end up with a full octet. And as we'll see in the next video, there are plenty of exceptions to this octet rule. But what this looks like is if we have, say, water and carbon tetrachloride, we want to take all the unpaired electrons from each atom and pair them up with each other so that we end up sharing the electrons and forming bonds. So we end up with bonds here. The electrons that are still in pairs but are not being shared are called lone pairs. And this is what the Lewis structures will look like for these, where the lines are the bonds and the dots are the lone pair electrons. To achieve an octet, some atoms will share more than one pair of electrons, though. So if we have one electron coming from one atom, one from the other, that's called a single bond. If we have two unpaired electrons from one atom and two unpaired electrons from the other atom, that is called a double bond. Three from one atom and three from the other, that's a triple bond. So for instance, with oxygen, we share two of these unpaired electrons with each other such that we end up with a double bond there. And with nitrogen, we actually have three unpaired electrons, and so we actually form a triple bond. So between oxygen, that's called a double bond, between nitrogen that's called a triple bond. And so for a double bond, we just draw two lines. In a triple bond, we draw three lines. So most covalent structures can actually be predicted by matching these unpaired electrons in the way that we've been doing so far. But this method doesn't work for all molecules. But a method called the Lewis theory does work for all molecules. So the rules for this is, number one, we want to count the total number of valence electrons for all the atoms in the compound and we'll, we can use the periodic table for that. The next step is to determine the central atom, and to determine that, that's usually going to be the one that's closest to the column that has carbon at the top. So if it's in the carbon column, and particularly carbon itself, that is going to be the central atom. And if you have something that is in the same column, then you want to look at what's lower on the periodic table. So number three, we want to put bonds between all the atoms to the central atom. And so each bond counts as two electrons. Number four, we want to fill in the valence electrons of the terminal atoms as lone pairs. So the important part about this step is that we're doing this on the terminal atoms, not the central atom yet. Then if there are any leftover electrons, then we want to put those as lone pairs on the central atom. So we do the terminal atoms first, and then we do the central atom last. And if the central atom does not have a full octet by the time you do all of this, then you want to make double or triple bonds with the terminal oxygen or nitrogen, sometimes sulfur, very rarely phosphorus atoms using lone pairs from the terminal atoms. So this will usually be between oxygens and nitrogens as terminal atoms. Sulfur sometimes show up, phosphorus can show up, but it's very rare. So let's go through a few examples here. So if we want to draw the structure of our carbon tetrachloride using Lewis theory, the first thing we want to do is count up all of the electrons. So our carbon has four electrons, and there's one of them. Our chlorines have seven electrons, and there are four of them. So we have 32 total electrons. Next, we want to find the central atom, but which atom here will be the central atom? So what we want to do, look at our periodic table. The things in these two columns are pretty much always going to be terminal. There are cases, as we'll see in future videos, where things like bromine and iodine can become central, but for the most part, we can think of these as being always terminal. Then these ones will be the second most terminal, meaning that they will almost always be terminal unless we have things that are more terminal to them. So these will be terminal unless we have, for instance, fluorine or hydrogen that we are bonding to them. And then we have these two columns here, these are the third most terminal, and again, by that I mean if we have anything from the other two columns that we looked at, those will be terminal to these ones, where these ones will be the central atoms. But if we have anything from this column with the carbon at the top, those ones will pretty much always be central. And so again, what I said before, if you have things in the same column, 
then you want to look lower on the periodic table. So for instance, if you had something that had both nitrogen and phosphorus in it, then you'd want to put phosphorus as the central atom. But here, our carbon tetrachloride, we have carbon as our central atom. So we can put that in the center. Then the next step, we want to place these evenly around the outside. And so that's putting the four terminal atoms here then we want to put bonds between all of the terminal atoms and the central atom. And so we have 32 total electrons. So now we are subtracting off the four times two that we used for the bonds. So there are four bonds, each bond is two electrons. So we have 24 electrons remaining. And so we wanna put the rest of them around the terminal atoms like this. So remember, we wanna start with the terminal atoms. So we put six around each one. We put them on until we fill up their octets, then move to the next terminal atom. And then once you have filled up the octets of all of your terminal atoms, then you would look to the central atom. But we see here, we've put six around each of the terminal atoms. There are four terminal atoms. So that means we used up 24 of our electrons. We have zero remaining. So this would be the structure for our carbon tetrachloride. The next one, we want to draw the structure of phosphorus trifluoride using Lewis theory. So we want to count up the electrons. The phosphorus has five valence electrons. The fluorines have seven each, but there are three of them. So we get 26 total electrons. And we see that fluorine is right there. Phosphorus is right there. The phosphorus is closer to the carbon column, and so that means it's going to be our central atom. Then we place the fluorines around like that, put bonds between them. We subtract off all the electrons we used for the bonds, and we have 20 electrons remaining. So then we put those ones around the terminal atoms, and what we then used was 18 of them. So we have two electrons remaining. We put those as a lone pair on our central atom, and then we have zero electrons remaining. So this would be the structure for our phosphorus trifluoride right here. The next one, we're going to do the structure of carbon dioxide using Lewis theory. So in this one, we want to count up the electrons. There are four from the carbon, six from each of the oxygens. So we have 16 total electrons. So we want to look for our central atom. We find the one that's in the carbon column. That's carbon. Pretty much carbon will usually be your central atom if there is a carbon there. So we can put that in the middle, put the two oxygens to the outside, put a bond to each of them. Then we want to subtract off two for each bond. So we have 12 electrons remaining. We put those as lone pairs around the terminal atoms like this. That uses the last 12 of them. So we have zero remaining. And those two have full octets. But we see that this carbon does not have a full octet. It only has two and four. It has two from one bond, two from the other, but it wants eight. So what we can do is take these electrons here, these lone pair electrons from each of the oxygens. We can then move those to the bonds like this. We can remove those, form the bonds, and so now we have these bonds between the carbon and the oxygen. The oxygen still have a full octet. The carbon now has a full octet, and so this would be the structure for our carbon dioxide. Next, we'll draw the structure of H2O, of water, using Lewis theory. So in this one, we have eight total electrons, six from the oxygen, one from each of the hydrogens, so that's eight total. We see that hydrogen is here, oxygen is over there, oxygen is closer to the carbon column, and so that means that oxygen is going to be our central atom. Then we have the hydrogens, we put those on the outside, we put bonds between them, then we subtract off two times two, so each bond is two electrons, there are two bonds, so four electrons, so then we have four remaining. Now we want to put these on some atoms, the remaining electrons but we don't want to put these on hydrogen. So hydrogens do not follow the octet rule. Those only ever want two electrons in their outermost shell. So having a single bond to each one actually fills up what they want in their outermost shell. So we want to put these remaining electrons as lone pairs around the oxygen on here. And so that gets rid of the last four of them. So we have this as our water. Let's look at another example here. So this is actually a molecule of formaldehyde, CH2O, and we'll draw this using Lewis theory. So we again want to get the total number of valence electrons. There are 12 electrons here. 
We want to look for what is the central atom. We have carbon, so that one is definitely going to be central. We put that there, then we can put the oxygen and two hydrogens around it like this. Then we put bonds between them, and so that removes six of our electrons, so we have six remaining. The hydrogens, we don't want to put any electrons around, so we'll just put those six around that oxygen. We subtract off the six, we have zero remaining. And so that means that the oxygen and the hydrogens, I guess technically, have full octets. Remember, the hydrogens only want two, so we can call that their full octet, but it's not actually eight, but they have full outer shells. The carbon, though, does not have a full octet, so we can take two of these electrons, so these blue ones here, we'll move those down to form another bond, and so we end up forming that bond between a carbon and an oxygen, and so now that carbon does have a full octet. So everything here has its full octet, so this would be the structure for formaldehyde. And finally, I have a few practice problems here. As usual, I encourage you to try these on your own before watching the rest of the video where I will give the answers. I'm not going to walk through the steps for each one of these, but I will give the answers. So I'll let you work on these. All right, for the first one, we have ammonia, and so we want to use the Lewis theory to get that. This would end up being the structure for the ammonia. If we did the chlorine, so this would just be Cl2, we would end up with this, so just a single bond between them. For silicon dioxide, it would look like this, very similar to carbon dioxide. Silicon and carbon are in the same column, so they have very similar bonding patterns. So it's essentially the same as carbon dioxide, except it has a silicon instead of a carbon. And then finally, for the O2, it's just the two oxygens, and they are double bound to each other. But anyway, that was everything I wanted to talk about in this video. I hope you found that helpful, and I will see you in the next one.